Assalamu alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Health Matters. Tonight in studio, our guest is Azza Mutara, a dietitian in practice for over 12 years. She is a graduate of the University of the Northwest. And Azza's focus tonight is going to be nutrition in pregnancy. Welcome, Azza. Before we begin, I would like to be, uh, start off with a terbiyah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. And I thought it would be apt to focus on the importance of motherhood and pregnancy. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said that paradise is under the feet of the mother. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the noble Quran in Surah Al-Fatr and he says, and no female conceives or delivers except with his knowledge. It is also narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If it is decided that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will make a child be born, he will make him in whatever shape he likes. This shows us that childbearing is a direct blessing from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and that one must be shown continuous gratitude for indeed the presence of a child has been likened to the fruit of a tree which brings a man and a woman closer to each other and as for mothers islam has made for them a beautiful world in which everyone must respect and revere them allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes and mentions the difficulties born by mothers. In Surah Luqman, verse 14, he states, his, mo his mother carried him through weakness upon weakness. In Surah Al-Awqaf, he states, his mother has carried him in travail and bore him in travail. Indeed, the status of mothers is even higher than fathers as demonstrated by the following traditions. A man came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and said to him, O Messenger of Allah, to whom should I do good? The Prophet said, Your mother. So the man said, And then to whom should I do good? The Prophet said, Your mother. Then the man said, And then to whom should I do good? The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Your mother. Then the man asked, After that, To whom should I do good? The Prophet said, to your father. It is also narrated that the Prophet was asked, peace be upon him, which of the parents have a higher status? The Prophet, peace be upon him, replied, the one who for nine months kept you between her two sides and then brought you into this world and gave you milk from her breasts. It is narrated from the Prophet, peace be upon him, the reward of a woman from the time of pregnancy until birth and breastfeeding is the same as the reward of one on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if a woman leaves this world during that time because of the hardship and pains of birth, she has the reward of a martyr. And any time a woman leaves this world because of labor pains on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise her from the grave pure and without an account of sins because such a woman has given her life due to the hardship and pain of labor. Jazakumullahul khair wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. We will now hand over to Azza Abrams, Azza Mutara, who is actually going to be focusing on nutrition in pregnancy. And I think it is apt to ask, what do you actually mean when you speak about nutrition in pregnancy, Azza? Assalamu alaikum, Shaida. It's good to be here with you and with all our viewers. When we speak about nutrition in pregnancy, we are simply meaning enough nutrients to sustain the growth of a fetus to term, inshallah. And then also incredibly important for the mother to also sustain her stores in this time of pregnancy because 
it's no point that alhamdulillah we sustain a pregnancy to term but the mum is left depleted so that would be basically my definition of nutrition in pregnancy now we hear from lots of young mothers and um, having worked with lots of young mothers uh, around pill popping you know the the vitamins popping the vitamins drinking the shakes what is your response to that so definitely pregnancy is not a time certainly for fed diets um, it you should never use a shake or supplement to substitute a whole food diet which i think is the most optimum diet for pregnancy perhaps if you like we can talk a little bit about what exactly a whole food diet is because this is what i think is the most important diet in this time so when we talk about whole food we talk about food with a very low human interference factor so these are foods that haven't been changed by the hand of man or in a factory they are as they say they are for instance if you have fruit it says what it says it is the minute it's been cut up and canned and sugars and preservatives and addi uh, additives have been added it's no longer a whole food and it's now a processed food processed food is the opposite of whole food so a whole food diet is exceptionally important in this time and certainly you can use supplements as an adjunct to a whole food diet but it should never ever be a replacement for a whole food diet no supplement or tablet or anything in this time should be so that takes us on to the next point what role does nutrition play in pregnancy and why is nutrition so important in pregnancy absolutely shaida that's a, a really important point because nutrition is imperative in this time because logically it sustains the growth of a fetus to term inshallah and then at the same time we don't want the mother's stores to be depleted so just like she's growing the baby alhamdulillah at the same time her body processes continue as normal and that certainly can't stop another important factor is that an infant has the mother's antibodies for up to 8 months following the birth so depending on the quality of a mom's diet the type and kind of anti antibodies is exactly what the infant will receive so optimum nutrition in this time is incredibly important i think my final point on this would be that for lack of a better word infants are almost parasitic on the mom system they will take exactly what they need to perfect their stores so that all their organs are formed all their systems are complete at the time of birth inshallah so if a mom doesn't eat from an optimum diet like the whole food diet her stores are basically depleted and, and that is i think a very critical point absolutely and the thing about it is moms actually feel this during pregnancy because they find they so exhausted um you know it's just been so much hard on my body than previous pregnancies and then their recovery is a lot longer so when moms focus on good nutrition and optimum diet in this time alhamdulillah it's not only a healthy baby but it's a healthy mom during pregnancy and in the recovery period as well so as how that takes us to the point of the recover pe recovery period and post pregnancy period because often uh, people are so focused on not uh, you know on the weight issue where pregnant mothers are overly concerned about gaining weight and then feel no but my baby is fine look at how healthy my baby is forgetting that the post pregnancy period is when it's going to take its toll on the mother where we are aware of cases where there's been dental problems um and hair loss but we know that's normal but it's sometimes excessive and even other health challenges perhaps you can shed some light on that absolutely this is where nutrition like i say is critical not only during but after as well for instance an important study was done where they found that moms that um lack in deficiency during the pregnancy period have a four times greater chance of postpartum depression than moms who are receiving adequate sources of zinc so really really important to focus on the diet like i say throughout the pregnancy period absolutely if you want to use a supplement in adjunct to a whole food diet fantastic but then also don't stop looking after yourself once the baby is there once you start looking after the infant don't neglect yourself nutrition in this time post recovery is just as important as before and then 
if one looks at comparison, you know, looking at the three trimesters, the first, second, and third trimester, and looking at the needs, the different needs during each trimester, perhaps if you can speak to that, inform the view viewers more uh, on that. Okay. So the first trimester, the needs are not necessarily increased in this time. Um, for those moms that are currently pregnant or have, alhamdulillah, had an infant, you know what the first trimester felt, felt like. So we're usually contending with things like nausea. Um, in many cases, there's vomiting, extreme exhaustion, food aversions, where even foods that we generally like, something that you can't stand the smell of. I remember thinking of myself, and I, was a, I am a coffee lover, but I couldn't stand the smell or taste of coffee in the first trimester. So it's funny how our taste buds change completely mm, in this time. Mm. So what I would recommend to mothers, I'm just going to talk a little on the first trimester before we move on. Um, what I would recommend to mothers in this time is to eat in response to what your body wants. It's almost like, alhamdulillah, the body is so fine-tuned at this time that it will tell you exactly what you need. Uh, you know, if there's something that you don't necessarily feel like it, eliminate it, you know. Many people don't crave things like caffeine and sugar, and this is not a surprise at all. So, for instance, if you're contending with something like nausea, a good idea is in a blender to sort of put a couple of cubes of watermelon, a couple of slivers of ginger, you know, a squirt of lemon, Make it into a smoothie if you like, mm. create it into popsicles. Cold things are often better tolerated in this time than warm ones. Um, something else like having six smallish meals instead of three very large ones. And then don't serve or don't reserve your biggest meal for the end of the day. Keep meals earlier in the day and then have just a small meal towards the end of the day. So that's the first trimester. The second and third trimester, however, is quite different where the kilojoule needs now go up to sustain the growth, alhamdulillah, about the, of this fetus. So it increases by only about 1,250 kilojoules. And that's the equivalent of about a small full cream yogurt and a handful of nuts or a smoothie. And most people are quite surprised when they hear this because pregnancy was the perfect opportunity to eat for two. And that's, this is certainly not a time to be eating for two. So eat in response to what your body wants, eat whole foods, quality more than quantity and let this not be a time for overindulgence you know it's a wonderful excuse let's eat as much sweets and chocolates and cakes and all the sort of nutrient deficient foods in this time you certainly don't want to do that in this time so to avoid the refined foods 100 percent absolutely mm. um, not just the refined carbohydrates but you know from all our food groups carbohydrates would be the least essential so when you do have them, and inshallah, we look at a plate model a little later, let your carbohydrates come from whole foods. Okay, and on that note, we'll take a short ad break and return to Health Matters. Welcome back to Health Matters. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our guest in studio tonight is Azza Motara, and her topic is nutrition in pregnancy. We'd just like to recap on the cravings and the responses to needs that one has during pregnancy. Azza, you mentioned cravings, and I just want to focus a little bit on things like strange things that people crave during pregnancy. We've had reports of people wanting to eat chalk, sand, baby powder, I mean, really strange things. Can you explain why that happens? Absolutely. Pika is something that's quite common during pregnancy. As you've said, it's, it's cravings for strange things. And a craving is almost always your body's way of saying that you are lacking something. So what I would do, instead of giving into a craving every single time, to sort of dig a little deeper as to what it is your body's craving. For instance, a lot of people that crave sweet things have an incredible deficiency of chromium. Or if you crave something like milk and dairy during the pregnancy period, it's usually a deficiency of calcium, where in that case you need to be eating more foods rich in those sources and then also considering supplementation. So a craving is, is almost like an incredible messenger that your body's getting at that time. Okay, and I think that's what our young pregnant mothers need to take heed of. 
coming to the pregnancy and the nutrition again, what is the optimum diet that one should consider or follow through in pregnancy? So when it comes to pregnancy, or basically for all of us, a whole food diet is the best thing to do. And I touched a little bit on the whole food diet in that there's a very low human interference factor when it comes to whole foods. But perhaps I can just expand a little bit on what exactly happens with a whole food. When a processed food is made, a whole food gets stripped of its nutrients. So it's nutrient perfection as it is in its whole food content is, is no longer there. So it's not only about what gets stripped, but it's also about what gets added to make it a processed food. And in most cases, it's things like flour and sugar. And almost always, it's the things that will cause an insulin response. And this is the thing we're basically trying to minimize when it comes to processed foods. Thank you, I think that's been so informative. But looking at now, if we break down the foods, as you mentioned earlier on, uh, the proteins, the carbohydrates, and the fats, and, and the needs for each of that, and the function that each plays. Perhaps if we can speak more to that. Absolutely. When it comes to carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, our, all our foods are made up of these three macronutrients. And I would say the one that was the least essential of the three of those was carbohydrates. When you include a lot of carbohydrates from whole sources, things like sweet potato, oats, brown rice, that's certainly the kind of carbohydrates you want to include in a pregnancy or in a whole food diet. It's the refined stuff and the sugars that you want to minimize as much as possible. Protein has an incredibly important role in terms of growth. And when it comes to pregnancy, it's not just the mother's bodily processes of growth, but growth of the infant, as well as fat. It's incredibly important in this time. When it comes to carbohydrates, if we can just explain a little bit about what carbohydrates does, mm. I sometimes find patients understand it a little better when they know the why. So when it comes to carbohydrates and sugar, specifically diets high in carbohydrates and sugar, basically what happens is your body reads any refined carbohydrate in the same way it would read sugar. So your glucose readings would go up and the body is such that it will try and get rid of that glucose as quickly as possible, it tries and get rid of it. And the way it does that is insulin is released. And what happens every time insulin is released? Fat gets stored, okay? So all along when we thought fat was actually the culprit for making us fat, mm. turns out it's not. Carbohydrates and sugars are the real culprit. Triglyceride levels go up. And this is the fat and this is the lipid that I think rece should receive the most attention, not necessarily chol cholesterol. And then finally, what we don't realize is insulin has got a very powerful vasoconstrictive effect. So all along when we were telling our hypertensive patients in pregnancy or otherwise, that they should be cutting down on caffeine and salt. Well, not actually. What they should be cutting out is, ho is, is refined foods and sugar because that's the big problem, because of this important vasoconstrictive effect that insulin has every single time you ingest a refined carb or you ingest sugar. Mm, that's very interesting. Uh, so you mentioned the function and needs of protein. Now we know that many, there are many vegetarians out there. And what is your advice to, to vegetarians in terms of the lack of protein? So when a pregnant mother is a vegetarian, she can actually get her, veg her protein sources from a number of vegeta vegetarian options. So things like pulses, lentils, um, beans, you know, these are all wonderful sources. What the only time a mother would require supplementation in pregnancy is that if she were a strict vegan. So in other words, if she cut out all animal products, a lot of vegetarians, um, sort of ovo lacto vegetarians, they still eat some eggs. Mm. So Unless she cut out all kinds of animal products, um, she wouldn't necessarily need any supplementation. So when you say all animal products, we're talking about your yogurt, your milk, yes. your cheese. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Absolutely. And eggs. Something I should probably mm. just mention when it comes to dairy products, and this is not just for pregnancy, but I think for all of us, is that steer clear of anything that says low fat on it. And most people are shocked when I say this because they always thought low fat products were good for them. but 
any time they create a low fat product, and I specifically use the word create because it's a processed product, they remove the fats from that product, but they replace it with sugar. So whenever we do dairy, we do full cream dairy. I like to tell my patients there's no low fat cow walking around anywhere on this earth. When the milk comes out, it's whole milk. The minute it gets changed, it gets processed, that's when they turn it into a low fat milk. And let's not forget the processing also strips essential nutrients. I like that one. There's no low fat cow walking around. Hey? I think I hope more people take note <laughs> of that. But uh, also, I want to just put a uh, speak about the banting diet and a lot of people what is your advice to pregnant mothers around the banting diet because a lot of people are implementing that in their lifestyle absolutely um, probably one of the shocks people hear when they hear a dietitian actually not being against banting I think there's some wonderful components or proponents to this eating plan one, for instance, is that it excludes sugars and refined stuff, very similar to what I say. It goes back to eating real food. So all the box stuff, all the canned foods, all of that gets eliminated and we eat real food. That's one of the great things. Banting is a ketogenic diet. So I certainly would not recommend it in pregnancy. But if it's a way, what banting basically does, because of the ketosis, it breaks the vicious cycle of sugar and carbohydrate addiction. So a, a diet that I advocate strongly for is low carb, healthy fat. So it's sort of very little grains and sugars in the diet. And banting is the ketogenic form of low carb, healthy fat. So I'm certainly not against the banting diet. I wouldn't recommend it for pregnant mothers, most certainly not. Um, but yes, it's got a lot of positive components to it as well. Okay, so there's quite a strong support and following Absolutely. amongst the medical professionals I've had that response. Um, I saw just the difference between you mentioned low fat milk and, and your full cream. So does that apply to your low fat yogurt and full cream yogurt as well? Absolutely. With okay. a low fat yogurt, in most cases, what they'll do is, again, they'll remove the fat. It's very seldom that you actually find um, a low fat yogurt that doesn't have sugar added to it. In all cases, they've sweetened it or they've added some sort of taste enhancer. So I tell patients, you know, do full cream yogurt and there's a number of brands available. If you really require something to sweeten it with, do something like xylitol or sweeten it in a natural way, you know, mm. adding some berries or fruit and, and that's a good way to sweeten it. So you recommend xylitol? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think it's, a, it's the, the sweetener with the least side effects. Great. Aspartam, et cetera, has got a number of side effects. Mm. And the role of essential fatty acids, what role does it play, especially during pregnancy? So essential fatty acids is incredibly important for a pregnant mother. And it's especially important because we don't make these essential fats, so we rely on our diet for them. So things like the essential fats EPA and DHA play a really important role in the development of the infant brain, in retinal development, and then also have a really strong immune function. So good sources of essential fatty acids are things like fish, nuts and seeds. I usually tell my pregnant mothers that they need to be having fish at a minimum three times a week. I know there's a lot of fears around methylmercury in certain kinds of fish. As long as you steer clear of your predatory fish, things like swordfish, um, Atlantic mackerel, shark, sort of the fish we don't even find on a South African market, you should be safe. And the shellfish? Shellfish is, shellfish is generally fine. Um, the selenium content of fish is usually enough to counteract any sort of mercury risk. So as long as you do safe sources, things like normal mackerel, salmon, tuna, snook, you should be perfectly fine, even shellfish. The selenium content is, is sort of almost that safety net that um, protects the mother from any sort of methylmercury poisoning. But yes, I would steer clear of the predatory fish. Mm. Now, I know you've prepared a table, a model on an uh, eating plan, and perhaps we can speak to that as, as you go sure. along. We'll look a little bit at the plate model. I think maybe they need to put the slide yeah, we're just on. waiting for the slide. Great. Mm. So this is essentially what I suggest a 
pregnant mother's plate looks like. It's certainly the ratios, you know, nobody's plate looks exactly like this. It's the ratios of what should be on a mother's plate. So at least a half of your plate to come from things like low carb veggies and salad. And I should just quickly mention something here when it comes to the low carb veggies. We get two different kinds of veggies. We get our high carb veggies. These are the vegetables that grow beneath the ground. So things like potato, sweet potato, butternut, um, corn, peas, these are all your high carb veggies. But then we have lots and lots of low carb veggies and they're all incredibly delicious depending on how you, cre how you prepare them. So things like mushrooms, there's a list of almost 22 plus low carb veggies. All your green leafy vegetables, mushrooms, cauliflower, all kinds of peppers, um, brinjal, tomatoes, onion, these are all wonderful examples of your low carb veggies. So like I said, at a minimum, we say half a plate should come from low carb veggies and or salad. You could do both of them. And then again, the way to prepare them is never to steam them. Shaida, you will know nobody ever said, oh, I crave half a plate of steamed vegetables. No one ever says that. <laughs> so when you prepare it with olive oil or cook it in butter or, you know, sort of do it in the oven with a little bit of cream and full cream cheese, vegetables now, you know, take on a whole new role and they're exciting and they're delicious and who doesn't love eating something like that? So that's, that's half of your plate at a minimum. Uh, a pregnant mother can eat any, ma any person, for instance, can eat as much low-carb veggies as they possibly want. You can never, ever overeat on the low-carb veggies. Then a quarter of your plate um, should come from protein. So as we said, things like meat, fish, eggs, um, chicken, that sort of things. And, and it's about, like I say, it's about a quarter, but if you're not so sure, then you look at your hand and it's your palm minus the fingers. That's your protein. And then finally, we've got our carbohydrates and healthy fats. And this is incredibly important that your carbohydrates come from whole food sources, the sources we meant earlier. So things like brown rice, uh, sweet potato, some butternut. I would actually even mention a mother that has diabetes or is insulin resistant in this time would do well to even reduce the carbohydrates even further and rely only on the low carb veggies as a carbohydrate source. That would, this would provide very effective control um, in terms of blood sugar. And then finally, your healthy fats. So as we said, you know, things like butter, olive oil, coconut oil, nuts and seeds, avocado, olives, and make sure these are there. These are essential fats, they have a really good reason, and they make food taste delicious. Let's, let's not forget the real reason we all eat. You want something that tastes really good, and healthy fats do that, but they don't have the effect on blood sugar like carbohydrates do. So are you saying, Azan, that it's okay to have that half a plate of salad drenched in salad dressing? <laughs> you know, the problem with salad dressing is that most salad dressings are processed and they're so high in sugar, you'd actually be appalled when you find out how much sugar there is. If you're going to do salad dressing, I'd say do your own, do it from home, um, include real fats, you know, you could do like a cream, an avocado in a liquidizer, sort of just blend it all up, add some olive oil. You've got a wonderful salad dressing to go rather than the processed stuff you'd find on a supermarket shelf. Thank you. And on that note, Shukran, we'll take an ad break and the lines will be open for any questions or comments after the ad break. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Health Matters. For those viewers that have just tuned in, tonight we have Azza Mutara, a dietitian, and the focus of her discussion is nutrition during pregnancy. As we mentioned earlier, the lines are open to the viewers to phone in with questions or comments. So please feel free to call Azza Mutara on 011086 double seven, double seven. So just recapping on the nutrition and the importance of supplements during pregnancy. Absolutely. You know, I'm not a big fan of supplements when it substitutes for a, a good optimum diet. Certainly, I know a lot of parents um, sort of using multivitamins and stuff because they feel their children are not eating enough. But if there's a time where I really recommend a good supplement, it would be pregnancy. So I'd recommend three. 
the first one being just a general good overall multivitamin and mineral formula. You need to take about two tablets a day to get the RDAs in. One is not enough to meet the RDA. And then an essential fatty acid formula, so one that contains both EPA and DHA. And then finally, a vitamin C. So about a gram a day of vitamin C. You can even up it to about two grams a day in the winter months when we're all sort of fending off flus and there's a higher incidence mm. of infections, mm. etc. So those three would be my essential ones. Optional would be something like a CalMag, so a calcium magnesium formula or an iron supplement. I would discuss with your obstetrician so that they can individualize um, you know, with it, when it comes to the calcium, magnesium, and then the iron. But the, fir the former three that I've mentioned, I would say I'd consider those essential. Okay. And there's no possibility of people overdosing on supplements. You know, our bodies, again, are so fine-tuned that it will take exactly what it needs, and then it will discard what it doesn't need. The infant is very similar. There's no such uh, thing as toxicity during pregnancy unless you're doing really excessive amounts. But in most cases, your body will take exactly how much it needs and then sort of discard the rest in, in very expensive urine. Indeed. <laughs> okay, we have a caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Brother, go ahead with your question. Yes, uh, um, what I would like what I would like to know is why go? Yes, um, what I want to know is... Brother, can you switch can off your the television, please? Because it's, we're having difficulty with the reception. Okay, just one second, please. Okay, one minute, ma, one minute, ma. Why is she telling we can't eat sharks? <laughs> okay, it's, <laughs> it's not necessarily the shark that you can't eat. It's the simple reason that the methyl mercury content in fish like shark and Atlantic mackerel, etc., is very, very high. So basically, the methyl mercury gets converted and then can be given over to the infant, which makes it dangerous. So it's not so much about not eating the shark. You shouldn't be eating shark anyway. <laughs> um, but yes, that's the reason. <laughs> Is, has, that, has your question been answered, brother? But, but, but that's the thing now. That's the thing now. Ma, see, what, what I'm asking now, something is, what happens if we don't catch fishes but sharks? Your TV is still on, brother. I don't think we can, uh, you know, it's affecting the reception. The signal is being interrupted. Okay, sorry, sorry, Ma. Oh. All right, Ma. All right, Ma. Okay. The question was answered. No problem, Ma. Shukran. Thank you for that. Okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. So maybe we can continue with the role of essential, uh, the fatty acids, eh? the essential fatty acids. So we have spoken a little bit about this. Um, like I said, they come from sources like nuts and seeds, fish, and you know, making them a part of the diet is really important. When we speak about our eating plan, you'll see that I've included them at quite a number of spaces, things like you know, at breakfast time for snacks. A really good idea is you know, using something like full cream yogurt, adding a little bit of nuts and seeds to it, some berries. It's a so wonderful maybe snack option. So you can option. tell viewers what specific nuts you're making reference to. Okay, absolutely. It's things like almonds, um, pecans, uh, you know, all your seeds, sunflower seeds, linseed, uh, macadamia nuts. These are your low carbohydrate nuts. So they're fantastic for all of us. For pregnancy, they're excellent because they also have a lot of the essential fats and other minerals in them. Um, things like peanuts and cashews would be classified as a legume. So you know, stick to the low carb nuts. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have another call on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Um, actually, I'm the mother of my daughter that is pregnant and she's working, so she can't talk to you personally. She's on duty. Uh, she's having a problem of now and again low blood. Uh, like standing too long for about 15 minutes and or out of the shower, then she's having these spells 
of low blood. I don't know if you can help her there in that way. What should she really do about it? Okay, can I just ask, did she suffer from low blood before falling pregnant? Is it so, sort of something she's always suffered no, from? No, only during her pregnancy. Okay. The, this the, is going to be her second child, but the first pregnancy she had the same problem. She, sorry, what problem? Same problem. Oh, the, the yeah. same. Okay. Yeah. Well, the good news is you rather suffer from low blood in pregnancy than high blood pressure, preeclampsia, because okay. that comes with very, low blood comes with very little risk. I think if oh. she's receiving an adequate diet, you know, um, adding, people say adding salt and stuff will make a difference. It really doesn't. So as long as she's eating a whole food diet, I've given you a couple of examples of things to include. Maybe considering a supplement in magnesium, that might help a little bit with the, the blood pressure. But at okay. this stage, I think the only real thing that will solve this issue is, inshallah, the birth of the baby. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for You're your welcome. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay. Yes, you, you were talking about the essential fatty acids, and, and I know we spoke about specific nuts, but there are concerns around like the macadamia nuts to be quite, you know, fatty. Yes, and those are the essential fats we're talking about. Okay. That's the, the eighth so of your plate that I'm talking about. You so want the weight those gain. fats. I, I'm actually going to the <laughs> weight gain issue. Okay, those fats won't cause a weight gain. Um, I feel like fat has been villainized as the okay. culprit when it hasn't actually been the cause of weight gain. The cause of weight gain is refined foods, processed foods, and sugar. You get good fats and you get bad fats. Certainly you get a lot of toxic fats. Something like margarine is a toxic fat. I think mm -hmm. we'll continue with this, inshallah, after the break. Um, no, we have a co another call yeah. on the line. I think people are very interested in what you have to offer them tonight. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. I just have a quick question. I wanted to know why is the dietitian promoting a full cream and full fat yogurt? As you know, these are more saturated fats and can cause heart disease. Uh, why can't we opt for low-fat milks and substitute creams for some other ingredients in our cooking? Did you get that, Reza? Absolutely. Thank you for your question. I'm, I'm really glad that you actually touched on that. Um, I think we've started a little bit talking about fat. Saturated fat has been long villainized as the culprit in our diets. Saturated fat won't cause cholesterol um, to the caller. It certainly won't cause, if anything, it increases your HDL cholesterol. Earlier I mentioned the only lipid that we really should be looking at is triglycerides. If we don't have cholesterol in our bodies, we literally die. So it it's really doesn't, and saturated fat doesn't cause cardiovascular diseases, refined carbohydrates and sugars. Um, are the cause of these things. So as I explained earlier, when it comes to all sorts of dairy, we use full fat because the low fat stuff is processed. The low fat stuff has got fat removed from it, but sugar and additives and preservatives added to it. So as long as we're mindful with regards to eliminating processed foods, eliminating sugar completely from the diet, as, or at least as much as possible, it's perfectly healthy to enjoy these healthy fats as part of an eating plan. Okay, and has that your question been answered, sister? Yes, Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And on that note, we'll now go into an ad break and continue with health matters. It will be the last segment of the show. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Health Matters. We are on the last segment of the topic of nutrition uh, during pregnancy with Azza Mutara. And Azza will continue now. She's got something very exciting lined up in terms of a menu sample. Uh, so we will, but I've just been informed that there's a call on the line. So we'll take the call and then continue with your menu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Sister, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Azza for such a wonderful program. Indeed. The nutritional advice is absolutely essential for pregnant women. What I 
Please continue. Switch off your television so the signal can come through. Okay, no problem. Um, what I'd like to find out is, is uh, the... Um, can we possibly substitute uh, vitamins in the form of a pearl for the actual uh, uh, nutritional uh, value? Does it have the same nutritional value as having actual fruit or vegetable? Is it the same thing? That's what I'd like to find out because sometimes when you are pregnant, you don't want to eat certain vegetables and you have an aversion to it. Mm. So if you have an aversion to it and you take a tablet for, uh, to replace that because you need the essential nutrients, is, is, it, is it the same thing? Thanks to the caller. That's an excellent question. You know, it would never ever be, the quality would never be the same as if it came from a whole food. Obviously, if it's in the form of a pill, it's synthetic. Yes, your body absorbs it only to a certain percentage, but the absorption rate would be limited. So I would never say substitute the tablets for, for a whole food diet. Do foods as much as possible to gain your nutrients from, and then use a supplement in adjunct to a whole food diet, never as a substitute. Has, has your question been answered, sister? Yes, it has. Jazakallah. Okay. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Azza, we can continue with your sample menu. I think it's very essential that the viewers get to view that and it's an opportunity for them to learn from. So the sample menu, which hopefully you've got on your screen, um, is basically I've given a couple of options in terms of breakfast, snacks, lunch and dinner. And for breakfast, we've done sort of an omelette made with low carb veggies, the low carb veggies I spoke about earlier, and a little bit of cheese. And then again, fried in butter or olive oil. So it's absolutely delicious. Who doesn't love something like that? Or you could do what I call an oat sundae. So it's about just about a quarter cup of cooked oats. A lot of the nuts and seeds, the low carb ones we added, uh, we spoke about earlier. You can add some berries to it. I should just mention when it comes to fruit, berries is your best friend for all of us because it's so low in carbohydrates. You can eat as much as you want, whenever you want. And then obviously also a fantastic antioxidant. And then also just to that oats, adding something like a full cream yogurt or milk, depending on whichever you prefer. So that's just two options for breakfast. We then move on to a snack and I've suggested a small pear with a handful of almonds or boiled egg, halloumi cheese and evo salad. Okay, Evo again, wonderful essential fat, um, really wonderful. It doesn't have any effect on blood sugar. So doing a salad with something like that, um, or like I say, then doing a whole food, a pear with almonds. Lunch, we've got a sweet potato, small one. So your carbohydrates would come from the sweet potato portion. And then it's a salad that I've basically made up here. So it's a sweet potato salad with chunks of pumpkin, some feta and pumpkin seeds, you know, really nice. Uh, pregnancy is certainly not a time where you want to spend hours in the kitchen, so this is something you can put together in a really short amount of time. Or if you want to, you could do, you know, especially if you work and you, you prefer something more sort of that can fit into a lunchbox, a steak salad and veggie wrap. Uh, you could use low carb uh, wrap, something like a cauliflower wrap, or, you know, if you don't have something like that, doing a lettuce leaf or a nice spinach leaf just to wrap it in sort of an innovative idea. Then I've got for the snack, I've got full cream yogurt. As we mentioned, when we do dairy, we do full cream with berry seeds and nuts. Again, essential fatty acids, wonderful way of containing whole foods. Or we've got what I call low carb, healthy fat chocolate mousse. Um, it's absolutely decadent. The recipes for most of these, by the way, I should just mention, are on my Facebook page called The Dietitian Mum. And like I said, the LCHF mousse is also there. Um, you know, who doesn't love something made with dark chocolate and coconut oil and like I said, it's absolutely yum. And then finally, for dinner, we've got um, a chicken and vegetable curry with kohli rice. So kohli rice is basically just cauliflower that's been broken down into small little pieces to sort of make a rice. Or if you do brown or basmati rice, I would say make sure that it's no more than half a cup. If you did the cauliflower rice, you know, it's a whole food, you could eat as much as you like. Um, the chicken and vegetables, as you can see, is, is a whole food. So it's real food, you know, there's nothing processed on that plate. So even if you, you know, make it in the form of a curry, that's perfectly good. There's no reason why you can't. I'm so sorry, if I sorry, can just sure. inter interject, you say 
half a cup of rice. So is it cooked rice or is it uncooked yeah. rice? So Just the cooked version is a half a cup of brown or basmati. Okay, because anything more than that, obviously, you'd have uh, quite a considerable insulin response. And then finally, I've got um, salmon, you know, that those wonderful EPAs we spoke about earlier with creamed veggies and a portion of butternut. So in that case, your carbohydrates would come from the butternut, the butternut being the starchy vegetable. And then, you know, your, your creamed veggies you could do with the low carb sort of a veg bake. It, it tastes more like something made with, uh, it tastes very casserole because you've, you've got cream in there. So it's absolutely delicious. My mouth waters already when you talk about cream as <laughs> it sounds so, so delicious. And I think, um, yeah, for the viewers, we need to look at Azar's Facebook uh, because you've got lots of recipes there and I'm sure it's all delectable recipes, but healthy as well. I should hope so. Okay, uh, I think we've got a caller. This will be the last call because we're coming to the end of the show. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I just want to thank Azah. Um, I'm seven months pregnant and I was hospitalized. Um, when I got to the hospital and when they tested my sugar, it was, <coughs> it was 11. And since then, I started working with, uh, with Azah and it came down to six. So, Alhamdulillah. I just want to thank Azah for all her support. Um, and I reward you. Amen. And that is one Amen. question. Sure. Um, can I take um, dark chocolate if I have diabetes? You know, I would say keep it as an occasional treat. Uh, you certainly don't want to have it every single day, but dark chocolate is fine. You know, uh, it's obviously better than regular chocolate, which is very, very high in sugar. The reason it's particularly bitter is because the sugar is so much less and the cocoa solids are higher. So if you're looking for an occasional treat, the LTHF mousse, for instance, is made with dark chocolate. So it's fine for an occasional treat. I just wouldn't make it an everyday sort of thing. It's perfectly good. Okay. You're welcome. You're most welcome. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, we're wrapping up, Azar. You've got 30 seconds before we finish the program. I just want to finally mention um, the father of modern medicine, Hippocrates, said, let food be thy medicine. And I think there was a real wisdom in that because before we turn to pills and sort of all sorts of other therapies, let's look at our diets, you know, let's look at what is contributing to illness and what foods can prevent it. Those would be my final thoughts. Jazakallah. If I may, if I may just quickly say something. Um, I know I've got two very special viewers that are watching. My mom had her birthday yesterday. My dad celebrating his birthday on Tuesday, inshallah. I just want to say happy birthday, mom and dad. I love you billions. Okay. On that note, Azza, we would like to take this opportunity to say it was absolutely informative, enriching and enlightening. And I'm sure we're going to be following your Facebook page with lots of recipes to be made at Thanks home. Thanks for having me. And just a reminder to the viewers out there that next week uh, we will be having an ophthalmic surgeon, Dr. Mohammed Saluji, who will be speaking about uh, glaucoma uh, and awareness. It's about glaucoma awareness. So just to whet your appetite and to tease you for next week that you look out for the program. And once again, shukran to the viewers. And in concluding, I would like to end with a verse from the Holy Quran. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wal asri inna al insana lafi khus illa al ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Sadaqallahu ladhim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.